What's up, Vertical Church? We are so excited to be with you on another week of Vertical Online. Wherever you're at, at home, uh, or wherever else you may be, just feel free to stand to your feet, uh, praise and worship the Lord as if it were a, a regular Sunday. So let's praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Come on. for this time, God, for this time to worship you. I invite you to worship to this new song that we're going to sing. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard it. It's called The Blessing. And this song is a prayer. And during this time of, of, of adversity, this time of, of the unknown, I encourage you to just sing this song over your life. Um, it, 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 in one part of the song, it says, Amen. And amen, it, it means, it's, it's almost like, a, like it, it is sealed. It is, um, it, it's like a declaration of, of this song. Um, it's like sealing the deal, right? And, and if you really believe that in your life, if you really believe that the Lord's going to bless you, and he's going to heal you and be with you, then I invite you to sing this song. We love you, Lord. you and keep you make his face shine upon you be gracious to you the Lord turn his face 
face towards you and give you peace. Come on, let's sing it out. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. you believe it, let's sing it out. Amen. 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 shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn this face towards you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Come on, sing it out. children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family and your children and come on if children, you believe this why don't you sing it out from your home may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming, and you're going, and you're weeping, and rejoicing. He is for you, 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 He is for you.
Hey, Vertical Church family, what a great moment we just had in worship. I'm glad you're connecting here with us today. Although I can't physically see you, we're still connected spiritually. So we want to take a couple of minutes and just share some good news with you. That's right. And one of our favorite parts of sharing good news with you all is that we're all a part of it. The first good news that we want to share with you is that we continue to support local ministries and organizations in our community through giving. That's right. And this is all possible because of you, Vertical Church family. We understand that this may be a tough time for people to give but we're believing the Lord that will that he'll provide uh, perhaps you haven't been affected financially and if that's you we encourage you to continue giving there's also a crisis fund that we have on our website 100% of the funds go towards the affected families and organizations and here are the different ways that you can give yeah, and not only are we making an impact as a church financially, but also through our life groups. During this time, we can't meet physically, but we continue to grow in our relationships through virtual life groups. There are so many of you that are already connected, but there's even a greater number of you that are not. And it's so important for us to stay connected, especially in this time. And, and we just want to encourage you to join a virtual life group. You can find these through our online directory at verticalchurch.com. That's right. So more good news. We continue to connect for an important time of prayer every day, Monday through Friday, 12 p.m. in English, 12.30 p.m. in Spanish, and Saturdays at 9 a.m. in English and 9.30 a.m. in Spanish. I know for me, the these have been uh, great times to be able to connect, yeah. right? And we'll be going live through Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, and another thing, parents, there are two great kids experiences available for your kids on Sunday services. It's a full service with worship included. You can find these on our YouTube page. And also make sure you're following our Vertical Kids Instagram to stay up to date. That's right. And now this is a very important announcement for all team impact team members okay so next wednesday is our uh, dna night all right so we're going to continue to connect and uh, just spend time as a family and also share important information that you don't want to miss so next week may 6th wednesday at 7 p.m connect through verticalchurch.com and click on the media that's right and we continue with the good news we are finally in the month of may and you know what that means right Mother's Day is oh, coming yeah. up and we want to celebrate all the moms. So next week we'll have a special Mother's Day service to honor all of our vertical mothers so you don't want to miss it. And to make sure you don't miss any services of the Vertical Kids Experience, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Vertical Social. Turn on that bell to get notifications and stay up to date. Okay, so now I just want to say, guys, we miss you. Yeah. And even though you might be at home and not in our physical location, you can still connect with God. Today, we're gonna to continue our series, our series, Heroes of the Faith. So I wanna encourage you to turn off all the distractions, put your phones aside, get your Bible, your notebook ready, and prepare your hearts for an incredible message. Church, it's so good to be here on Sunday, like a big family all over South Florida, all over the U.S., and all over the world. Uh, hey, if you're connecting with us for the first time, my name is Pastor Verge. Uh, my wife, Ghislaine, and I have the blessing and the privilege of pastoring this wonderful church family, Vertical Church, exists to point people up to God, teach them to follow Jesus, and equip them to make a difference. We are one church, two languages. We do English and we do Spanish. And we have a big vision uh, to be a multicultural, multi-generational, life-giving church that opens up its doors to people of all backgrounds, believing that God has a purpose and a plan for every life. We feel a strong calling to make an impact in this world as a bilingual church. And so I just want to welcome everybody connected at home, everybody uh, that maybe is connected from wherever you might find yourself watching this message. We are so happy you're here. And I want to give a quick shout out to our Zoom audience. Hey, Zoom audience, can you all say hello, Vertical? Ready? One, two, three. 
Hello, Hello vertical. vertical. That's it. That's it. Hello, Zoom audience. Thank you guys for connecting live in this service. Um, man, I want to just say that as a, as pastors, we feel so privileged and so blessed to be part of such a special church family. Um, I, I really want to honor my wife, Pastor Gislen, brought a fire word last Sunday. She brought that teaching on Deborah and being courageous and, and being people who encourage each other. Um, uh, we were so blessed by that message. I also want to take a moment and honor you guys, honor our church. Uh, my wife and I and my kids received a, uh, a loving, life-giving parade uh, last uh, Saturday uh, of people from our church. Many of you who came by, drove in front of our house and, and were beeping and honking and had posters just blessing us as your pastors. We felt so loved, so blessed, so surprised, and so encouraged. So just on behalf of my family, thank you for supporting us and praying for us as your pastors. We feel extremely loved and extremely well supported uh, from our church family. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for honoring us and blessing us uh, in that way. So today we're continuing in part three of our Heroes of the Faith series. Now this is a great series because we're, we're taking a look at, at different heroes of the faith throughout the Bible. Uh, and this series is really an encouraging series. It's a motivating series, and it helps us get in the Word. The, 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 key, the key verse or, or the, the heart verse for the series is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, which says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So the goal of this series is to listen to the voices of those who already finished their race and get advice for our race. Because the reality is we are still running this race called life. The Bible uses that example multiple times throughout the New Testament. And those who have already run the race will always see it from a better perspective than those who are actually running in it. And so because we're in it, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but it's harder when you're in it, it's harder to see it and understand it. Have you ever had somebody come and tell you about a problem and you easily saw like, oh, of course, well, listen, here's what I encourage you to do. Because it's easy for you to see from the outside what somebody else is going through. But then when, when it's your own race, when it's your issue, and you're like, man, I don't know what to do, somebody else might have a good perspective. So the idea is we are, we are sitting in, in, uh, uh, with this great cloud of witnesses that Hebrews 12 talks about. Hebrews 11 talks about all these heroes of the faith. So the idea is we're running the race in the stadium and every Sunday one of these heroes of the faith is coming down. One of these witnesses is coming down from the stands and running a lap with us and giving us some great advice, some great counsel. What advice would each of these heroes of the faith give us? Well today we're going to tap into Abraham. We're going to talk about Abraham, also known by many as Father Abraham, Father of the Faith. So uh, I want to take a moment and I want to just, I want to just pray. Um, and and um, at the end of this prayer, I want all my Zoom, my Zoom audience to give me a good, I'm going to say, in Jesus' name we pray. And I want to hear a big amen, all right? So let's pray. Lord, we just come before you today asking you to speak to our hearts. We pray that the seeds of truth from your word would land in fertile hearts today. And I pray that these seeds would grow, that they would flourish, that they would give much fruit, Lord. Lord, uh, we just pray that our hearts would be receptive, that our minds would be receptive and open, and that we would learn what we need to learn from you. Thank you for your presence, and thank you for the power of your word. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. So we're going to talk about Abraham today, and Abraham is known as the father of faith. Now, now faith, is, faith is that ability that even when you don't have any idea what's going on, you can still move forward trusting. Faith is the ability to trust. And the message today is really for, for when you don't understand God. And if you're taking notes, I know a lot of you like to take notes or you're following in on our, on our Vertical Church app or website. Here's the first, the first thing that I want us to talk about. When you don't understand God's ways, God always does the right thing. And I want my Zoom audience to help me with the right thing. Ready? One, two, three. God always does 
the right thing, the right thing. God never does the wrong thing. He always does the right thing. Why do we teach this? We teach this because many times we have thoughts that God is not doing the right thing. Sometimes we're saying, are you sure, God? <laughs> and so we're going to look at three different stories from Abraham's life, and we're going to talk about how we can increase our faith and trust God. You know, some people say or believe that Christians have blind faith. You know, Christians just, oh, you just, you just have blind faith. And, and it's not really a blind faith. I, I'm not a person who's just going to be a fool that just does whatever. No, 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 no. I'm trusting that God is so much bigger than I am. And there is so much more to him that there are simply some things that I'm never going to be able to understand. So I choose to understand this. To get to a point where I'm okay knowing later. And that, that might be a good word for somebody today because trusting God means that I have to understand sometimes it's okay for me to know later. I might not know right now exactly why this is important. For example, I want my kids to trust me and to be okay with knowing later because my kid who maybe is in fifth grade or sixth grade or second grade, uh, th I might say you have to go to school. You have to do your schoolwork. And they might say, but why, why? And I say, just trust me. Later on, they might not get it now how important school is and education is, but later on they'll be able to know why later. They just need to trust me now. And so in the same way, we have to be okay with the parts of God and the world that we don't currently understand. We've all experienced times when we thought God didn't make sense. You know, all kinds of world situations. It doesn't always make sense. This situation, th this whole uh, global pandemic, coronavirus, I mean, who, who imagined this? In our, in our human minds, we might think this doesn't make sense. God, I don't get it, right? When we, when we suffer the loss of a loved one, especially if it's, if it's premature and, it, and, it, and it's like too early, the person's young, and you lose a loved one, so many times the thought comes to our mind, what's going on, God? This doesn't make sense. Or those times and moments in life where it seems like God didn't show up. We all experience this. And I want to look at the life of Abraham and touch on various stories about his life and what we can learn today about his experiences that will help us run our races today. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, starting in verse 1. And it says, after this, the world of the... The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Okay, so pause for a second. God was coming to Abraham. Uh, at that time, still his name was Abram. because He was coming to him because he was already discouraged. He had been promised that he would be the father of many nations. And he's getting older and older, yet he doesn't have a child. And yet how is he going to be the father of many nations? So God is coming to encourage him. In verse 2. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Okay, so, so in this scenario, God has this dilemma. The dilemma is that you and I don't see all the time. We, we don't see it. He'll make his attempts to help us see it, but sometimes we don't see it. He tried to help Abraham here. Hey, listen, go outside, look at the stars. He tried to help him understand, but Abraham just couldn't see it. Sometimes in life, we begin to see it. Now, faith says, I will trust and believe even when I don't see it. There's a big aspect of faith that's all about this. So, so let's go to the, first, the, the next blank on the worship guides. And you if you're taking down notes, uh, this is the key phrase for the first four points is that God always does the right thing. Here's number one, even if it takes a long time. And I want my Zoom audience to help me with a long time. God always does the right thing, one, two, three, even if it takes... A long time, even if it takes a long time. Uh, Abraham would say to me or to you or to all of us running the race, he, he would probably say, I was expecting God to give me a child when I was able to, when I was young, when I, I would have expected God to give me a child when my reproductive ability was, was high and intact. I had no idea he would do it after, 
And, and this same thing will happen to all of us. You and I will sometimes think that God is taking too long. Remember Lazarus' and sisters? They told Jesus, Jesus, you took too long. It's too late. He's dead, right? And so God promised that Abraham would be a father of multitudes. And there are a couple of things that I'm going to share with you today about God that you're not going to like, but you need to know. I don't, I'm not going to like it, but I need to know it. God is notorious for taking a long time. <laughs> or at least what seems to you and to me as a long time. And until you get comfortable with the ways of God, you're never going to enjoy the Lord. And my goal for you uh, today is to say, you know what, I may not get it. But I'm going to trust that God's ways are always higher than mine. His thoughts are always higher than mine. Abraham didn't understand the promise that God gave him. How do we know that he didn't understand? Because he took matters in his own hands. He and his wife Sarah saw that there was no child. They're getting older. So they came up with their own plan B. Let's help God. None of us have ever done that before, right? Genesis 16. Genesis 16, verse 1. Now, Sarai... Abram's wife had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. Now, we all that have read this before know that this was a very dangerous decision. There was a baby named Ishmael who was born. He is the father of all of the, Ab the Arab nations. And Abraham's lack of patience cost him a lot. And we're seeing the effects of that decision even to this day with all of the dissension between the people of Israel and the Arab nations. Uh, our timing and God's timing are rarely the same. And so in our society today, I admit it, faith can be tricky because we have this instant mentality society where we're used to getting what we want now. We're used to ATMs. We're used to microwaves. We're used to drive throughs Now we're used to Uber services. This is the mentality we're used to. But you'll never be a great person of faith until you can understand that God is a patient God. It reminds me of a joke that I heard once. Uh, a guy asked God, hey God, what's a million dollars like to you? And God said, it's, it's like a penny. Then the guy asked, God, what's a million years like to you? And the God answered, well, a million years is like a second. Then the guy said, hey, God, can I have one of those pennies? And God said, sure, just wait a second. I know, I know, it's a corny joke, but the reality and the truth is that God is a patient God, and sometimes we think he's taking too long. We read this verse last, uh, uh, two weeks ago, 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness, because that's how we understand it sometimes. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So our God is not slow the truth is that he's patient, and he wants the, his kids to be patient too. Patience is the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. And, and even though we wish we didn't have to be patient, God is determined to work this out in our lives. So, so point number two, God always does the right thing, number two, even if it seems absurd. Even if it seems absurd. So I want everybody on, on the Zoom call, my live Zoom audience, you're going to say absurd. I'm going to say even if it seems, you're going to say absurd. One, two, three, even if it seems absurd. absurd. Even if it seems crazy. Even if it seems like, whoa, this is absurd. Every once in a while, God does some things that seem absurd to us. God waits till Abraham is 99 and Sarah is 89 years old. And then he says, okay, it's time now. For them to have their child, right? And the Bible says that both of them laughed, but it wasn't a laughter of joy, like, oh, how wonderful, my child is coming. No, it was a it was the laughter of like, yeah, right. Us have a baby, look how old we are. Genesis 18, following on the story. Genesis 18, verse 10. Genesis 18, 10. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this next, this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. <clears throat> Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself, and she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? 
Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Now, now can you imagine this? Can you imagine Sarah, 89 years old, with her other 80 or 90-year-old friends saying, hey, girls, guess what? <laughs> can you imagine? Imagine the talk between her friends about Sarah getting pregnant at 89. Almost as if God was saying, I'm waiting till you're this old just to prove to you that there is nothing too difficult for me. I'm going to return, he says, at the appointed time. At the appointed time. Hey, this is something that really has grasped my, my heart and my attention in these last couple of days. Did you know that God has an appointed time for everything? I, you, when you were born, that wasn't a surprise to God. When I was born, when, 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 when we came to, that wasn't just random. No, no, it was God's appointed time. C can I just say something? Sometimes in life, we lose loved ones. And we never want to lose a loved one, but sometimes it's, it's God's appointed time. Sometimes we face pandemics. It's never on our agenda, hey, next year or, hey, in three years, we should go through one of those global pandemics, right? And nobody puts that on their agenda, but God just has these appointed times. People also lose their lives. There's an appointed time, and I, I want to just remind all of us today, if we can't trust God for this, we can trust God for nothing. At one point, we will all see our last day here on this earth. But as believers, we know that our last moment here means that our first breath there is close. And so whether we're 20 or 50, whether we're 100 or 150, there is an appointed time. And I really want to say that as a, as a word of encouragement, number one, because some of us have lost loved ones or will lose loved ones or even in this situation God is still in control. But also, God knows my appointed time. And so I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to live in fear and think that all of a sudden that, that my time is going to come out of God's hands. God is in control. The whole world is in his hands because God has an appointed time. Check, check out, I want to check this out. The God that we believe in, the God that we serve is in control of everything, including our lives. Look what it says in Romans 4, chapter 19. Speaking about Abraham, it says, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, because he was old, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead, because it was old, her womb, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That's amazing. That's the type of faith that Abraham is giving us advice on. It required trust. Point number three, God always does the right thing. Number three, even if it doesn't seem right. Even if it doesn't seem right. Hey, Zoom audience, can you help me by saying seem right? Ready? One, two, three. Even if it doesn't seem right. Even if it doesn't seem right. Even if it doesn't seem correct. Sometimes it's not that he's late or patient. Sometimes it's not that he's absurd or it seems crazy to us. This is the idea of, of sometimes we feel, God, you're wrong. You're not doing the right thing. I want us to take a look at a story here in Abraham's life where God made the decision to destroy the city of Sodom. Uh, it was a vile, ungodly, unrighteous city. The only problem for Abraham is that his nephew Lot lived in Sodom with his family. And Abraham didn't think it was a right decision that God wanted to destroy this city because his family members lived there. And so there's this bargaining that begins to happen between Abraham and, 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 and God. Look at uh, Genesis 18, verse 23. Verse 23, it says, Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Okay, we can stop there. Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? You know, it, it, the reality is, in this story, Abraham starts bargaining with God. Hey, are you going to sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Because he knew his family was there. And he kind of says, hey, God, what if there was 50 righteous people in that city? Would you, would you relent and not destroy it? And God's like, okay, maybe. And, and then Abraham says, what if there was 40, right? You, some of you have read that story. What is, and then it gets down to the lower numbers because he knew how many family members he had there. And, you know, there's times when all of us question God. And, and, and I've thought about this and I've read about it a little bit, but 
Questioning God is not wrong as long as you come to the right conclusion. I'm going to say that again. Questioning God in a moment of, of doubt or, or you know, lack of clarity, it, it, questioning God is not wrong as long as you come to the right conclusion. In fact, even Jesus appeared to question God when he's on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because there's times when we all wonder, God, are you doing the right thing? But we all know that Jesus said, your will be done and not mine. So you can have moments where maybe you question God as long as you come to the right conclusion. And Abraham does come to the right conclusion. Look at verse 25. At the end of verse 25, it says, will not the judge of all the earth do right? In other words, God's going to do the right thing from time to time based on your idea of righteousness, your idea of, uh, uh, of, of justice or mine, uh, you know, our understanding. We might think, God, you're not being fair, but remember, God is always right. Faith understands this. Proverbs 14, 12 has a wise word. There is a way that seems right to us. There's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. So there's a way that appears right to us as human beings, but in the end, it leads to death because God is the one who knows the true way. So what do you do? What, what, what do we do when two parties disagree? Well, you have to kind of decide to go with one or the other. What do you do when you and God disagree? Well, let me give you some advice. We have to trust God. We don't need to trust and agree with our own position. We need to trust and agree with God. Let's go to point number four. God, is, God always does the right thing, number four, even if we don't understand. Even if we don't understand. Hey, Zoom audience, help me out with understand. Ready? One, two, three. Even if we don't understand. 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 That's right. Even if we don't get it. Even if we don't understand, God always does the right thing. God tests Abraham with the greatest test of his life. Abraham and Sarah, finally, they have their promised child, Isaac. We know the story right after all the years of waiting. And God tells him to take his son to Mount Moriah and to sacrifice him or kill him on an altar. You've heard the story, I'm sure. God never intended for Abraham to go through with actually sacrificing and killing his son, Isaac. It became a test of his faith. The interesting part is that Abraham questioned God throughout most of his life, but by this point, it seems like Abraham didn't push back. He followed God's instructions. He never complains or questions it according to scriptures. Why? Because by this time, it seems like Abraham trusts God. And this is what I want for you as a, as a Christian believer. This is what I want for everybody in our church. That the more you serve God and he's faithful and he is right, that you would begin to live actually trusting God even when you don't understand it. Even when you don't understand what he's doing. The, the, the story, uh, this story is in Genesis, but there's a reference in Hebrews 11. So I want to read that reference. Hebrews eleven seventeen. 17. Look what it says. It says, by faith. Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. It seems like Abraham must have believed that even if he did sacrifice his son, his, that the Lord was just going to raise him up. That's how much faith Abraham had. That's how much trust he had. Do you want to know why? Because the more you know God, the more you trust him. The more you know God, the more you trust him. Psalm 9 verse 10 says, those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Here's the truth, everybody. And I really want you to, to kind of lean in with me for this moment. Here's the truth. God always knows best. And I'm encouraging you to give up the quest of wanting to understand everything. I'm encouraging you to increase your faith that God is on your side. God always knows best. Those who know him, trust him. Listen, listen, listen. Don't try to always understand everything. May the goal be to know God better. It's okay to understand things. That's why we read the Bible and we study it. But if the, if the prerequisite for every act of obedience in our lives is for you to understand first what you do is you reduce God to the size of your brain. And that's not a big God at all because none of our brains are as big as God. Instead, we need to begin to truly trust God. 
truly trust him. All right, so I want to finish off this message, some final words of encouragement. I think, I think some of Abraham's unique words of encouragement would be a matter of perspective. I, I think Abraham would say something, in fact, what would anybody who's in heaven probably say to us, and Abraham would probably say to us, hey, keep your eyes off of this place temporarily being the fulfillment of everything that you hope for in your life and put your eyes on a different place that's higher above. This is my most important responsibility, Abraham would tell us, to point people up to heaven. This thought and this idea can literally save your life. Why am I saying this? Because earth is going to disappoint you. This is a reality that we all have to understand. But if you have this, you'll experience some hurt here in this world and this earth, but you're not going to grieve like people who have no hope. If you embrace this now while you're on earth, you and I can live with true hope. What does the Bible say? Uh, say? The Bible says that the blessed hope is that Jesus is going to return one day for his church, which includes all of us who are believers, that have confessed him with our, with our mouths and believed in him with our hearts, and we will be with him in heaven one day. So think about it. What would Abraham share with, with us as encouraging words? Here's the next blank. Don't make earth your home. Don't make earth your home, your final destination. Why? Don't get too rooted and comfortable here on earth. Don't get to the place where your satisfaction and enjoyment and pleasure and the fulfillment of everything that God is has to be here and happen here. Abraham would encourage you to, hey, pass through the earth like pilgrims and travelers. That's, that's what we're doing. Because in the end, spiritually, we're not a citizen of earth. We're a citizen of heaven. A citizen of of heaven. Check this verse out. Hebrews 11 verse 9. By faith. Check this out. By faith. He made his home in the promised land. Like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents. As did Isaac and Jacob. Who were his heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations. Whose architect and builder is God. I am encouraging you to identify where your true home is. We have an eternal home. Abraham learned to focus everything on that place. Second thing here of the encouraging words, closing thoughts from Abraham. Live with an eternal perspective. And I want my Zoom audience to help me out with eternal perspective. Ready? Number one, two, three. Live with an eternal perspective, an eternal perspective. This means that the eternal perspective is in everything you do. It's in how you use your time. I'm, I'm going to use my time knowing that what I'm doing today is going to make a difference for eternity. I'm going to spend my money with an eternal perspective knowing that what I give to and what I invest in can make a difference for eternity. Hebrews 11, verse 12. It says, and so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Speaking of Abraham. Check this out. All of the descendants came after Abraham was gone from this earth. Isn't that interesting? Think about it. The promise, which is you'll have a descendants like stars in the sky, like grains of sand, but the promise was fulfilled after he was gone from earth, which sounds like a bad thing unless you have an eternal perspective. It sounds like a wrong, an absurd thing unless you have an eternal perspective. Then it's a reward. It's a joy. I'll close off with this passage. Hebrews eleven thirteen. continuing Hebrews eleven thirteen. All these people, in other words, all the descendants of, of Abraham, were still living by faith when they died. And all these people in Hebrews 11, all, the, all the, the heroes of the faith, they were living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, and they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. 
People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. These heroes of the faith mentioned in Hebrews 11, they get it. And they want you and me to get it too. There are so many things that I wish God would have done a different way in the world, maybe even in my life. But I am convinced that God always does the right thing. Hey, I really believe in my heart that if we are wise, we would take these these, uh, this advice and these words of wisdom and this counsel that Abraham would give us as we're running our race and that we would really remember that God always does the right thing even when it takes a long time, even when it seems absurd, even when it doesn't seem right, and even when I don't understand. Hey, maybe you're going through something right now. You don't get it. You don't understand why. And the truth and the reality is, you and I might never understand why while we're here on earth. It goes into a category that I call questions for heaven. But the truth is I've chosen to live my life in faith. And faith requires me to trust God even when I can't see him. To trust God even when I don't understand. Maybe God is reminding you today of his love for you. And he's encouraging you through Abraham's life. He's encouraging us to trust in God no matter how it looks, no matter how it feels, to trust in God. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for the blessing of being able to get into your word and learn from men and women of faith. I pray that today, every single person connected right now, watching or listening to this message, that every one of us would come to an understanding that you are God and that you are good and that you always do the right thing. I pray that you would give us patience in the moments where we feel it's too long. I pray that you would give us strength in the moments where we feel too weak. I pray that you would build our faith in those moments where we just don't get it. I hope and I pray, Lord, that we would develop a greater perspective of eternity, an eternal perspective, that we would not get cozy and comfortable here on earth, understanding where our final destination is, understanding where all your promises will be fulfilled, including heaven, salvation, and eternity with you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to pray one more prayer. You might be connected today and maybe you feel far from God. One of our main visions, one of our main goals, one of our main purposes for existing as a church is to help people to know God. It's possible to know God. I'm not talking about know about God. It's possible to develop a personal relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. We believe this at Vertical Church that Christianity is not a religion. It's about a relationship with God. And it's all a matter of making a decision, confessing it with our mouth, and believing in our hearts that Jesus did what the Bible says He did. He lived the perfect life. He lived a sinless life, went to the cross, paid the price. His blood was shed to bring forgiveness and opportunity and hope and salvation to us. The Bible says that we can be saved not by our good works, not by how much we have, not by uh, who we belong to, who's our parents or where we're from. We can be saved because of what Jesus did on the cross for us by faith, through faith, by grace. And so I want to pray right now this prayer, and I want to invite you. If you feel far from God and you want to draw near to God, or if you say, you know what, I've pulled far from God. I want to begin to truly know him. I want you to repeat this prayer with me. Everybody in all your houses or wherever you're listening to this, I want you to repeat this prayer for me. If you can honestly say, you know what, I I know about God, but I don't know him personally. Or I feel like I want God in my life to give me direction. I want to build that faith and I want to trust in him more. Say this prayer with me. Close your eyes and bow your heads with me and say, thank you, God, for loving me, for forgiving me. I recognize today that I'm a sinner in need of forgiveness. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I believe it in my heart, and I confess it with my mouth that Jesus died and he rose again to give me life. Lord, forgive me. Cleanse me. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Make me a new person. Renew my mind. Thank you, God, for loving me, for forgiving me, and for saving me today. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. Amen. I am so proud of you. Thank you so much for making the best decision in your life and for connecting with us here at Vertical Church. Hey, hey, I'd like to get the Zoom audience. Can you all say, can you all say, have a great day to Vertical Church? Say, have a great day, Vertical Church. Ready? One, have two, three. Day, have a great have day, a day. Day. day, Vertical Church. Thank you for connecting with us. We love you guys. We love our church. We love the Lord. Stay connected. God has great things. He always does the right thing. We love you, and we'll see you next time. Wow, what a powerful message from